work for Clover Health. My name is Christopher Hartfield, and today we're going to talk a little bit about the Clover Transform Framework. So this is something that Clover developed uh, over about a year, and it's something that we use to kind of democratize data at Clover Health. Uh, so before I start, I'll kind of give a quick introduction of what Clover Health is. Clover Health is an entirely new approach to healthcare. So we are a health insurance company. Uh, we have markets uh, in New Jersey, uh, Pennsylvania, Texas, and Georgia. Uh, a little bit about us uh, is we're a Medicare Advantage insurance company. So when you turn 65 in the United States, you have the option of either going into just traditional Medicare where the government pays your bills, or you can go into Medicare Advantage where the government pays a private company uh, to basically uh, run health insurance for you. Clover is one of those companies. So uh, we're a Medicare Advantage insurance company, so we pay claims and do health care um, uh, insurance for people who are over 65. So these are for seniors. Uh, we're headquartered in San Francisco. We have quite a large tech team here with about 50 engineers and uh, probably an equal number of data scientists as well. Uh, and we're venture backed by Sequoia, uh, Wildcat, um, and First Round. So a little bit about uh, what we try to do a little bit differently than other uh, insurance companies here in America. Uh, is Clover really believes that data is what can make people healthier and really drive down insurance costs. So uh, we, we take a lot of the data that we receive uh, from all of our different patients through all of our different interactions with the patients. We take the data, we put it through a variety of pipelines, we process it, and we look to find uh, unique trends in that data where you know, we try to predict diseases or we try to predict where people uh, might become ill or where they might be at risk for something. And we take that and then we drive interventions based on that. So we're really about using data to drive uh, better health care. So a little bit about uh, how Clover tries to do this is that we, we bring a lot of data into Clover. Um, most people probably don't realize that your health insurance company it pretty much has the bulk of healthcare data out there about you. So uh, anytime you go to a doctor's office, a whole bunch of data gets sent to your health insurance company. Uh, you are hospitalized, you have a surgery, you have a lab done, all of that data is going to a healthcare company or your health insurance company. So Clover receives an enormous amount of data uh, most, health, most health insurance companies, it's very siloed. Data that they receive for like utilization management, that's whether to approve or deny procedures, uh, that just kind of sits in one database. Information from, a claims, from claims, that sits in another database. Appeals, that's another database. And so really in a lot of health insurance companies, data is extremely siloed. And data is only connected by people. And that's a real problem because it takes people looking at it or doing it in Excel uh, to really connect the data. Clover sees things a little bit differently. We would like to actually, and we do, put all of our data into central data warehouses. And then from there, we can derive better analytics, and we can have systems and processes that automatically predict diseases or you know, potentially life-threatening healthcare events for our members. So when you think about this, uh, there's a large amount of data coming into our insurance company. So uh, one of kind of the oh sorry one of the kind of buzzwords out there is a data lake, and it's the idea that you kind of put all this data that you have in all of its different formats into kind of a central spot. And a lot of people use like S3 or maybe Postgres in some form for doing data lakes. Um, and, and that makes a lot of sense for a health insurance company. Really just getting all the data in one place where we can query it and make connections between it, that makes a lot of sense for us. Uh, so that's what we do. We put it all kind of into a central data lake. Uh, from there though, that's, you know, most people would say, great, you have it all in one place, you can analyze it, end of story, you know, you make tons of money, it's all done, uh, it's wonderful. Uh, but that's not the case. Like, the, all the analytics that we need to do, all the things that we need to find in all of our data is a huge amount. There's no way that engineers or even data scientists can do all the querying and all the analysis that needs to go into an actual health insurance company. It's just unfathomable amounts of data and a huge number of queries and transforms that we need to do on that data. So Clover actually trains a large amount of our insurance operations people uh, SQL. Uh, I don't think there's really uh, many other healthcare companies that do this, if any, um, but we have uh, probably close to maybe, uh, sorry, uh, close to about uh, maybe somewhere around 100 people who actually know SQL that are not technically trained. So they don't come from a technical background. They're not a data scientist. They're not an engineer. They may never have learned a programming language, uh, but we actually train them in SQL and we actually train them to build these pipelines. So we have people in insurance operations. They may be in claims, they may be in payment integrity, they may be in provider 
uh, operations or utilization management that actually know how to query uh, a Postgres database. Um, so in doing so, what this talk's going to talk a little bit about today is, is kind of the ramifications for that and how we kind of control that. Uh, so obviously, uh, that can lead to a little bit of a wild, wild west scenario where things are kind of, um, people are just building transforms on a whim. Uh, you have a lot of transforms that are, um, ah, sorry, uh, that are just being created kind of on the fly. And so our talk today will talk a little bit about how we control that and how we make it easier for people who are maybe not technically trained to actually build their own pipelines and build their own transforms that then can be run in Airflow or other traditional uh, data processing pipelines. So Clover has more than 800 different unique transforms. So this isn't just we created 800 transforms in a for loop. These are 800 totally different kinds of transforms. Uh, they're almost, most of them, probably around 90% are SQL transforms. So they take a bunch of SQL from a bunch of different tables and then they transform that into a new table. So like this is a hypothetical example. Uh, we get some membership data and then we get some claims data. We look for claims that were uh, that happened for dates of service after a person died. So this would be like a potential fraud or payment integrity issue, you know, that we shouldn't be paying for things after someone has died. Um, so uh, Clover has more than 800 different kinds of these, uh, and most of them are in SQL, but we also have quite a few of them in Python. And a lot of them are written not by data scientists or by engineers, but also by people in insurance operations. Uh, so what, is the, what are kind of some of the problems that we saw? Uh, some of these might be a little obvious, but uh, for starters, this doesn't show up so well in this slide, but there are um, an absolute ton of transforms in this picture. This is a picture from an Airflow deck. And there's absolutely, there's, uh, there's probably a few hundred in this picture here alone. Um, is one of the problems we saw is that people were just kind of dumping them into one pipeline. People didn't really build all their transforms in distinct pipelines, like a pipeline for claims or a pipeline for providers. People were just dumping into this one massive pipeline. And you're not really building a pipeline, but you're creating a web, essentially. And that, that can lead to a lot, of, uh, a lot of problems. We also didn't have really good ways of testing this. You know, people are building these really complex pipelines, and you know, uh, how do you actually go about testing these? So those were kind of some of the problems we saw, and we just kind of saw this, this web develop of, of processes and tasks, and we wanted to kind of uh, make it easier for people in, in data science or in insurance operations to actually uh, build more distinct and, and better defined pipelines. Another problem we saw is that we were running all of this in Airflow, so it was really easy to run just a single task, uh, or you can clear out tasks, for those of you familiar with Airflow, you can clear out tasks and run the downstream of them, or you can run kind of the whole pipeline. But it's difficult to run just a section of the pipeline. So with some of our pipelines that are really huge, uh, there are times we want to rerun uh, just a particular section of the pipeline, or we need to rerun it uh, just locally for testing. And that's pretty difficult because you have to either set up Airflow or you have to run them manually, just copy the SQL and put it into Postgres. And that's really, really difficult. So enter kind of the Clover Transform Framework. So this is kind of a little bit of a framework that we developed uh, around all of our different transforms uh, that make it easier for people to build transforms and build pipelines. Uh, so what it is, is it's basically kind of a wrapper around the business logic. So one of the things that we saw with some of the problems is that we had, you know, kind of business logic code, you know, like code determining like payment integrity or something like that. And we saw that mixed in with like, sorry, we saw that mixed in with uh, like custom monitoring or we saw people build like, you know, special transaction handling in Postgres or things like that. A whole kind of random collection of weird things. And we thought, you know, like, Really, we want to separate the business logic and, you know, kind of uh, from the actual infrastructure, from the data infrastructure. So that's what the Clover framework does. It really kind of wraps around the transforms that someone would build, kind of wraps around these SQL or these Python transforms, and then makes it really, uh, and then just kind of abstracts away all the infrastructure away from, uh, from people. And that really makes it easier because if you're a data scientist or you are in insurance operations, you do not want to worry about airflow. You do not want to worry about, uh, am I monitoring this correctly? Do I have the correct infrastructure to notify people when something goes wrong? Uh, that's not something that most data scientists really want to spend time doing. 
Um, so the Clover Transform Framework is basically a wrapper around the code, and it defines both the inputs and the outputs. And we'll get to why that's really important uh, for this. Uh, so what does this actually look like? So basically, we have people writing a lot of SQL transforms. And so what the transforms actually look like is there's basically a YAML block at the top of the SQL, uh, which defines what the transform looks like. And that is a little faint. Um, so, uh, but basically it defines what kind of transform we want to run. In this case, it's a, um, let me see if this laser works. It's a create table as. So we're going to take this SQL statement here and actually create a table based on the SQL statement here. Uh, we also have documentation built into it. Uh, we, and we also define the output, and this is really important for testing. So one of the things that we did, that we ran into before, was people would just kind of build SQL files and tell Airflow, go run this. But the problem is we really don't know what the actual inputs to that file really are, and we don't really know what the outputs to that file are either. And that creates a lot of issues, both from a testing perspective and also like just understanding what is the lineage. It was very difficult to reason about in these very large pipelines. What is the lineage of data? How does it flow from, you know, how does the data flow from one table to the next, to the next, to the next? That was very, very difficult to reason about. Um, so we define both the inputs and the outputs here. We also have documentation built in, and the documentation actually with Python goes actually into the Postgres database comments. Uh, but we have all of that built into this nice little YAML here, and then we have the SQL at the bottom. And so at the end of the day, you just have to write a select statement. It will actually create the table based on your select statement. It has monitoring built in. It has documentation built in. And we'll actually explain what some of those features are kind of down the, the road in this presentation. Um, one other thing we also have is owners of the transform. So we actually define who is the owner at the company of this transform. Uh, so having 800 transforms, data science or data engineering cannot be responsible for all of them. Uh, that's obviously unsustainable. Uh, so we actually have people in insurance operations who actually own the transform. So if something goes wrong, they're notified about it. They can adjust business operations if, if it's not something they expected. And, and that really ensures that that kind of breaks down some of the gaps that exist between engineering and operations that exist in just about every company. Um, so we have a couple different kinds of transforms. I talked about one earlier, which was the create table as, where you just kind of give it a select statement and it creates a table in Postgres as that. We also have upsert transforms. Uh, we also have just pure uh, SQL or Python transforms that you can run. Uh, load transforms, where you can pull a file from S3 and load that into the database or vice versa. And then, of course, no ops, where you just want to model the output of something. Uh, but you don't actually want anything to run. And that's, that's a very interesting transform as well. Uh, so what does this look like under the hood? So under the hood, this is a little bit of code here, but this is the create table as transform. So at the end of the day, um, the operations person will write their SQL, put the YAML on the top, and then just kind of send it off to be run. But what actually happens under the hood is we start by creating a transaction within uh, Postgres. We create the schema if it doesn't exist. Uh, we actually start by creating that table in a swap table. So we actually put underscore swap at the end of it. Uh, and so we don't actually affect the regular production table while we're regenerating this. Uh, we, then we uh, drop if there's been a previous swap table. Uh, we create the table using that SQL. Uh, we execute it with explain first and log the explain. So actually in the logs, you can see the explain. So if you have an Airflow task that's been running a really long time, you're like, why is this running so long? Uh, you can actually go in and click in the log, and you'll see the explain statement there. And you'll say, oh, this explain is really high. Uh, this is because something changed. And we actually know why. Uh, then we add extras. So in that uh, YAML definition, they can define foreign keys. They can define indexes. We add all of those for them so they don't ever have to write you know, create index or create foreign key or handle the naming conventions that we want for it. Um, and then we also run validation checks and validation um, structural checks. You can also define your own in that YAML. So people can define their own checks that if they fail, then we roll back the transaction. And then finally, we swap the tables. And then we analyze the table at the end. So we do a lot uh, for, this, for this particular small little transform, which is pretty much just creating a, a Postgres table, which is very tiny. Uh, but all of these things help to really uh, enforce good practices all under the hood without you know, insurance operations or data science from having to, to understand all of that. 
Uh, another thing is we, we built a CLI included in this. So the graph structure of it is actually uh, contained within the transform framework. Um, so we actually have a full CLI that can, uh, that can visualize part of the graph. So you don't have to visualize the whole thing in Airflow or you can use the root parameter in Airflow to look for some of it. But you can actually visualize just a piece of it. Uh, you can also run just a piece of it. So this particular um, uh, command here will run just this part of the pipeline. Uh, and we'll actually also do templating. So we use Jinja templates, and you can use the start function that walks you through. Um, oops, sorry. Uh, that will walk you through uh, basically, you know, kind of how to how to set up the transform. So it makes it really, really easy for people to build transforms, uh, especially if you're not technically inclined. So that's uh, so it includes a full CLI, and again, you can do all of this, run it against, you know, actually staging data without ever having to go into Airflow, which is a big thing for, um, you know, people. Um, for people who are in data science or insurance operations, they don't necessarily want to play with Airflow. It, it can be a little bit of a hassle sometimes. Now, one of the things we talked about with is uh, defining the inputs and the outputs. You know, why not just run this transform as is? Why not just send it off and, and let it be run? Why do I have to define the inputs uh, for it? And one of the reasons is, is because we really found out that when you just kind of send a task off to run, even though it may have unit tests, let's say someone has changed something way upstream in another task, and then that causes the downstream break. Uh, so, like for example, let's say this task right here. Let's say someone changed this one up here, and it flows through these tasks. They work okay, but it causes a break here. Maybe it causes a constraint violation or something. Um, typically, we would not see those until they would actually hit production, and that was a really problem thing because if you have 800 transforms, something's always breaking, uh, and that's a really serious problem. Um, another thing we saw is what happens if you have two pipelines. You know, Airflow does a good job of associating DAGs together in one pipeline, but what happens when pipeline number two here has dependencies on pipeline number one? How do you actually model that, and how do you actually make sure that if someone changes the output of pipeline Pipeline one that it doesn't break pipeline two. Well, that's what we did by modeling the inputs and the outputs of the uh, of the transform. And by having that, we can actually build structural and validation tests where we can actually run an integration test automatically uh, for this particular task, where we build the basically the table for this one and the table for this one, and make sure that the SQL runs accurately against them. So we can basically ensure that we never get like a missing column error in, our, uh, in Postgres at all with these transforms. We can pretty much ensure that the SQL will never have a syntactical error in production ever, uh, that you know, the pipeline's not really going to have a break in it. So it's really about creating a, a very strong validation pipeline. Uh, and at the end of the day, we do all of this automatically. So if you're an insurance operations or data scientist, you don't have to worry about it unless it pops up a little error saying that you, know, you broke downstream pipelines. So uh, we also wanted to build a, a testing infrastructure for this. The testing is still in Python, uh, though uh, in the future we'll probably build some input-output testing in, in maybe just YAML or, or just some sort of CSV files. But uh, we also built uh, a testing framework where you can look at the upstream tables or the, down, or the upstream tables and, and pull the structure from its output, create that structure, and then pass in like test data. So if you're testing a transform and you have two upstream tables that feed that transform, you probably want to, in unit tests, create those tables and then feed test data into it. Um, normally, that's a lot of setting up. Uh, you have to, you might create the table in SQL Alchemy models uh, or a couple other ways, and then, or just raw SQL and then pile a whole bunch of data into it. That's a lot of code, and that's a lot of code that's kind of be duplicated. So what we did is created a lot of boilerplate functions that you just kind of define the upstream transform. Uh, from any different pipeline, and then we just kind of mock it out and pass in the data. One of the other things that we did was we realized that some of our transforms are huge. They were really, really large. And how do you test a transform that is 200 lines long of SQL? And that sounds kind of ridiculous, but that is actually a fair number of our transforms. Um, and so how do you test like an individual component of it to make sure the logic actually works? And so one of the things that we developed, which is actually open source now, and you can go find it, is called PGMock. Um, it's in Cloverhouse public GitHub. And basically allows you to take out sections of the SQL and test them. 
So actually, in this particular case, what we do is we have a subquery here. And we say, we don't really care about testing that subquery. We just want to test maybe this select up here. And so we can actually sub out. We can use this uh, little package to actually sub out pieces of SQL with test data. So here we sub it out with uh, you know just kind of like these random high values here. And then we can just test this uh, SQL uh, as is. And um, it's, it's great for testing, um, sorry. Uh, it's great for testing uh, large pieces of, of SQL. Uh, so, and this is totally open source, so you can find this today. Um, and it's, it's a really nice package for testing large SQL. Any questions? I know I've just kind of flown through all of that. Any questions? We, no? Cool. Oh, one in the back. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned how Scratch framework allows individual to pass code to other functions. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, pass. Uh, any sort of like uh, query from other uh, pipelines that might be upstream, uh, is that all tested locally or? Yes. Uh, okay. Yeah, it's it's actually tested in the unit test. We have continuous integration that will test it too. So if you you know you cannot push it to master yeah. until that is tested in the continuous integration, and the continuous integration will test that you're not breaking uh, those pipelines. So there's also a local Postgres there's then, also that's a backing local individual Postgres, contributors. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So cool. we actually each one of these transforms is run, sorry, is run in a Postgres transaction. Yeah. And we actually create the upstream tables and down or the upstream tables in that transaction and then run the transform and then close that transaction, sorry, and uh, close that transaction and delete it. And we do that for every single one of these more than 800 transforms. Uh, are there like other background processes for like syncing the individual's local Postgres with uh, what is in production? We, we can do that. Uh, because we are a healthcare company, we don't like to put too much PHI on someone's local machine. Yeah. So we don't want to put a whole bunch of you know, patient medical records on your health local machine. One of the things that Clover also has found is while unit tests are good, with a lot of our data pipelines, you really do need to test it with a copy of production data to really make sure that it's doing what you think it's going to do. Uh, yeah. It's really hard to do just pure unit tests other than testing basic logic. So if you really want to, we, we try not to have people actually run it in, um, to actually pull data down locally. However, uh, in this previous one I talked about the run here, you can actually specify a staging database here, and it will run against a, a copy of production data in staging from your local machine, basically. So you can call it lo from locally. Thank you. Sure. <coughs> one more, yeah. I have a question. So yeah. how do you ensure that person A and B are not running the same queries or creating the same tables? How do we ensure that the person name or? No, person A and person B are not running the same queries or creating the same tables. Do oh, you have uh, something? at the same time, kind of like that? At the same time, or I mean, is this something that runs on a daily basis? Yeah, so all of these go into pipelines in Airflow. So Airflow kind of controls, and we only let it run at a certain amount of time within Airflow. Um, as far as running it locally, how do we make sure two people aren't running it at the same time? We basically just use staging databases for that. Um, so it doesn't actually hit uh, production. Uh, with most of these transforms, if two people do run it at the same time, you will get various locking errors in actually, it as well. I think my question was more of two people are creating the same table. So I, you guys don't care that multiple people can create the same table and oh, are repeating. How do we do access control? Is that kind of? Yes. Yeah, so as far as access control, it's a little bit of a different system. Uh, for the most part, uh, we've built access control into Postgres users. Uh, that limit who can access the table uh, at what time. And we actually have a whole different package that I could talk about that limits access control to the database and limits who can touch what and when. And that's all, of course, being a healthcare company, really important. Just, just to qual clarify, um, yeah. was, was there a question about like deduplication? Like yeah. two, two, oh. uh, two different people run the same kind of query and create mm -hmm. two tables which, yeah. which essentially have the same data. Oh, I see what you mean. How do we, yeah. I see the deduplication there. That's a problem that we have not totally solved. Um, we, uh, I'll talk about it in a little bit in the future, how we're handling discoverability. But certainly, we do have people creating tables that are a little bit similar from one another and probably could be just one table. It is a problem that we have, for sure. Yeah. Uh, but we'll talk a little bit about how we kind of try to prevent that uh, in the next slide, actually. So one of the things we have with this as well, though, is uh, monitoring built in. So one of the things is we, we use Datadog for monitoring uh, for 
keeping track of like the row counts, for keeping track of the number of uh, completeness of a certain column, how many null values are in a column. And all of that can actually be, de be defined in the YAML. So someone who's in insurance operations or data science can easily just define this in the YAML. It goes to Datadog. They don't more have to worry about any of the backend infrastructure. And we can use things like anomaly tracking in Datadog to know when something goes amiss. So this is a particular pipeline that um, got overrun in Airflow, actually. Uh, and so its normal daily snapshot count was here. And then all of a sudden, it jumped up really high. And so we can keep track of, of uh, basically when things go amiss. Um, and so this is, uh, this is one really nice feature. And again, it all happens in the back end. And you don't have to worry about building any of that out for your transforms. So going uh, to your question there about the deduplication, well, you have 800 transforms. How do people find out what these transforms do? How do they find out, like, I have all, maybe there's already a transform that does what I want it to do? How do I find out about this? Well, because we define the inputs and outputs, we can actually build full graphs of the lineage. And we've actually done that in an application that we call Data Bodega. And this is an internal application to Clover Health. And it allows you to search and document any sort of table within our system, as well as who is querying it, uh, who's querying it in mode analytics, and also see the lineage of it. So like this particular table has one upstream uh, table that uh, it's derived from. And then it's used in these downstream tables here. And so it, we have this whole application, this whole website that's built around that that shows the lineage. Uh, it also has all sorts of documentation. Some of that documentation comes from the YAML definition itself. Others of it, people can just type in and write themselves. Uh, we have links to various uh, documentation. Uh, so um, kind of the roundabout answer, answering of your question is that you know how do I find something like uh, how do we avoid deep duplication is basically we created this application that people can more easily find tables and find pieces of, of data that they can use in their various day-to-day -day operations and things like that. Yeah, question over there. Yeah. Uh, the question was, you know, like, is this only things that happen within this framework? Um, there are a few things. For the most part, it is uh, with things that are within this framework, which is pretty much most things that are at Clover. But it does have some things outside of it as well. It also has uh, reports. So we use mode analytics to, um, to do a lot of reporting. And we keep track of the lineage between these tables and mode analytics as well. Uh, so that's also included here. Uh, so another thing that we built on top of this is we have a couple different types of transforms. We also have machine learning built on top of this. So one of the things is you know machine learning has lots of infrastructure that goes behind this, and uh, both Amazon and Google have tried to you know build systems that make it easier for people to not have to touch the infrastructure uh, for machine learning. Uh, Clover has actually built this into our transform framework. So if you're someone who's in data science and you're like, well you know I really don't want to have to build all the scikit-learn models and build the infrastructure for it. Uh, you can actually just use this YAML definition, which will take input data sets. Uh, it will split up the data set, in this case, uh, into training and validation and testing uh, splits. Um, it also um, you know, has different features uh, that you can put into it. And it can run most of the scikit-learn um, classifiers and, and algorithms in there. And you can specify parameters in it. And again, it's all done via this nice little YAML config. Uh, so you can really easily try out different machine learning things. You can really discover things that you, know, you might not think machine learning would be good at, but actually is. And so we've done that with a number of, of healthcare things, and, and it's working out really quite well. Um, and it, it's very accessible to someone who's not you know, really heavily trained up in the ML side. Yeah, question over there. Can it what? One hot in code. That's that's oh. a typical uh, machine learning transformation. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I'm not as. Uh, up to date on some of those ML things. Uh, but um, I don't know the answer to that. So I, I could probably find out for you. But um, yeah, this, this, is, uh, this is what we use for most ML. So, um, but I did, sorry, I don't know totally the question for that. So, uh, so that's pretty much uh, the end of it. Uh, we'll open it up to more questions now. Uh, but before I do so, of course, I have to give this pitch. Uh, Clover is hiring engineers and data scientists really aggressively. Uh, I shouldn't say aggressively, but really passionately. Uh, we are trying to basically double the size of our, our teams. Uh, so we're trying to go from like 50 engineers up to like 100. 
Uh, so uh, if you if you haven't talked to one of our recruiters, you definitely should. Uh, Clover is a really great company. Uh, we do so many different things with data. We solve some really unique challenges that I haven't seen at any other company. Uh, we do everything from ML to data pipelines, data science. We do so many different things. Um, we're a company that we're really tackling one of the country's biggest problems. You know, how do we you know tackle healthcare, make people healthier, and reduce costs at the same time? It really is one of the biggest challenges in uh, in this country this day. We we have a team that really values diversity at Clover, uh, and it's a really passionate environment. I think everybody really wants to work there and really wants to make people's lives better. So. Um, so yeah, so um, if you're interested, uh, come see me in office hours, cloverhealth.com slash careers, or anyone with a Clover Health badge. So I'll go back to questions and uh, anything else. Yeah, um, yep. I was just kind of curious for the for some of the ML YAML stuff. Actually, you, I don't you, know where you are. I'm right here. <laughs> oh, right there up. you are. <laughs> <laughs> um, for some of the like ML YAML stuff you guys are doing, what so what does the workflow look like for someone who wants to use machine learning then in that case? So. Like what, what, what's their start and then how do they know how well their model did and stuff yeah, like that? Yeah, so we do have a lot of monitoring around the models as well. Um, I have to plead the fifth a little bit on this because I don't totally know the ML side. Uh, we haven't, we, uh, there's definitely engineers who could answer that much better than I can. Uh, but we do put a lot of monitoring into our, our machine learning. That was one thing why we, uh, the machine learning team picked Clever Transform Framework to build on top of is because we could build all of that underneath. I think they, they were worried that people would build kind of machine learning models um, without, um, you know, without actually doing any monitoring or actually monitoring how your feature sets change over time or anything like that. And so that's one of the reasons they built on top of this is that we could put monitoring right into it. But I can't answer specifically. I don't have the specifics on that, unfortunately. Hi, uh, yes. how did you structure your training program for the operations folks, and how did you deal with like obvious resistance you would get from? Right, yeah, that's very interesting. Uh, so I, I wouldn't say there was actually huge uh, resistance to it. The one interesting thing about operations uh, with healthcare is a lot of them are just craving more data. You know, they kind of see, you know, they have all this data, and like, I just want to know, you know, like, did this member have this happen on this day, or you know, is there situations you know happening in this particular with this provider that might be you know considered wasteful? So they're really craving data. So uh, when we started giving them the tools to do this, um, it's actually still kind of an opt-in program. Ah, sorry, um, it's still an opt-in program, and a lot of them continue to opt into it. So it's something that most of them really want to improve their skills and want to have these skills. Uh, to really make better decisions in their day-to-day -day operations. Uh, the actual program is, uh, is actually divided up into a couple different classes uh, that you take, and uh, they go all the way from kind of you know, basic SQL all the way up to like really advanced SQL building and even some Python as well. And it also ties in with our parsing framework, which I talked about at Data Engine Conf last year. So. Yes? Uh, do you oh, I think they want the microphone. <laughs> Do you have a review process for adding transforms to the framework, and how do operations folks yeah. handle that? Uh, yeah, we do have a review. We generally ask for a data scientist or a data engineer to review it. Uh, it depends on actually the transform itself. There are certain ones that uh, that just kind of are ad hoc and show up kind of out of nowhere, and uh, those we don't review as well. Uh, but typically, there's kind of a, um, I guess you could say, a life cycle of the transform. So they start off kind of ad hoc, and then they kind of move into a, uh, you know, a little bit more finished models where you know a data scientist might help. Uh, insurance operations build a better model. And then for some of them, like claims or providers, there's actually an engineer who has built out a full model for that. So there's kind of a life cycle at which it goes through. Uh, so it kind of depends on what stage in the life cycle it's in. It depends how much review it gets. So, is that enough to kind of answer? Is it like Git-based or? It's Git-based for the reviews, yeah. Yeah, we do it all Git-based. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, uh, you mentioned your framework supports updates, right? I uh, upserts, yeah. Upserts. So how do you avoid deadlock? Like someone is trying to do a create table, and other person is trying to do update at the same time. Uh, so we we do require uh, that for the most part in that one we do require it to be one transform one output. Uh, there are exceptions to that. We don't hard enforce that. For the most part, we just default to it being it needs to be upstream or downstream. So the two tasks cannot be parallel. They need to be upstream or downstream of one another. Okay. So whenever someone writes an update, you want it to mention the dependencies to it? Yeah, correct. All of these you have to basically you have to define all the inputs. You can't just like let's say you create a table that selects all from 
my table, you have to define that as the input. And if you don't, this validation system will actually fail. So if you forget to put an input, it will alert you. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Any more questions? Uh, okay. Let's let's do last question. And uh, before that, I I want to remind uh, how you know the speakers value your feedback. So mm -hmm. please go and pick one of those cards and uh, uh, tell tell us and the speakers how they're doing. Um, and then there's there are office hours uh, right after the talk. Uh, you see, yep. we're going to be in the, in the office hour, yep. hours, right? So so you're welcome to continue asking questions. And the last thing, uh, thanks for silencing your cell phones. The downside is that people tend to forget about them. So one, well, somebody forgot a cell phone, uh, and if if you are such a person, uh, just just go to a registration. They have some. Maybe, maybe they have your phone. So uh, we're. Yeah. One more right here. Hi. Um, so this goes a bit in the direction of mm -hmm. the question. Like, how do you ensure that data policies, like privacy policies, are being met if you have like a one big data lake instead of side yeah, of data? Yeah, it's, it's definitely a challenge. Uh, I kind of talked about that a little before. We have another framework called CloverDB that actually restricts access depending on different access levels to people. Uh, so there's different kind of levels of access that you can be in. So. Right, yeah, you may not be able to actually join those two tables. For the most part, uh, this runs in production, uh, so, you, um, so you are able to make the transform that makes those joins. You may not be able to see that data depending on your level of, of, clear, of your, the level in the hierarchy that you are.